I just wanted to thank everyone for joining our session. Uh, just I'd like to thank all the participants and also the speakers for their time. Um, if people are logging in from many different locations. I know it's a very difficult. Uh, uh, some, uh, some, some timings are very difficult for some of y'all, but uh, nonetheless, thank you all for, for, for being here. Uh, so this, record, uh, so this uh, webinar session is being recorded. Um, and, and just a few uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, we request everyone to keep their microphones off uh, for the duration of the speaker panel. Uh, we will be accepting questions for the speakers throughout the, uh, throughout the webinar, but uh, they'll answer the questions at the end. Um, at the end of the uh, at, at the end of the speaker panel, we will uh, we will we will go through a Q and A section, and over there you can ask your we can also ask your questions verbally if you if if you prefer. Um, so uh, so so this topic is uh, is especially important to us here at the Cirque. Uh, we find this topic extremely fascinating, uh, but unfortunately uh, we haven't seen much discussion in this area of research. So for us to have these uh, four speakers here with us today is 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 exceptional and uh, quite fortunate, um, especially today is in in the times of restricted mobility. The need for communication and information flow is extremely important. Uh, among migrants, especially, uh, the need to communicate and access the right information is all is essential to complete their journey, uh, leaving their home countries and coming to developed countries or uh, uh, environments that are completely unknown to them. Uh, social media is becoming more and more important for the general population and even more important for migrant communities and being able to connect with their fam family and friends back home make new connections that will help them integrate in the host country. And, um, and, and what we know from existing research is that migrants tend to use social media more frequently just before a migration event, after a migration and after a migration event. And for many refugees, even during migration, social media has become very important for them to complete their journeys. So, uh, so like I said, we are very fortunate to have these distinguished speakers here with us today. Cohen Lewis, uh, Irvin Charles Cabal Quinto, Priya Kumar and Maria Gentova. So without any further delay, I'm going to hand off to uh, Cohen to uh, start off our session. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot and greetings and good evening everyone from uh, Utrecht, the Netherlands. Let me just set up my slide share. Are you seeing my slides okay? Yes. Sure. Thanks. So I'm very grateful uh, to be able to take part in this uh, CERC migration webinar on uh, social media use and migration research. And thanks also a lot Stein for organizing this event and I'm also very much looking forward uh, to our comments from our uh, uh, fellow dear uh, panel members. Uh, so I'm currently uh, based at Utrecht University, but also a fellow at the Netherlands Institute of Advanced Studies and working on a book manuscript, uh, which is now titled Digital Migration. Uh, so what I'll be presenting here is actually uh, some conceptual contours around this uh, the difficult knot of understanding uh, uh, migration networks from various conceptual perspectives. So this will be uh, very much a conceptual uh, uh, paper intervention. I uh, uh, hope I will still uh, come across as clear uh, and lucid, but I'm also very much looking forward to your uh, comments and questions. Um, wait. So the structure uh, uh, of the talk is uh, as follows. First, I'd like to position myself uh, in, uh, uh, in the literature on digital migration, what do I mean with this notion of digital migration studies, uh, but also to locate where I'm coming from. So what kind of uh, uh, fieldwork, for example, experience I'd like to bring in into this conversation. Uh, and I'd like to especially uh, address this conceptual uh, uh, convoluted discussion across, uh, uh, across disciplines and fields uh, by addressing three paradoxes uh, of migrant connectivity, being the paradox of transnationalism uh, in opposition or and integration, uh, the second paradox being a question around information uh, circulating within migrant uh, networks, uh, zooming in on the conceptual uh, uh, continuum of information precarity and information commons. Uh, and the third paradox, uh, questioning uh, the, uh, uh, the paradoxes or the intersections and relations between 
uh, using um, digital connected uh, digital networks uh, to claim uh, digital rights to engage in human rights claims, uh, as well as how migrant networks are also targeted for uh, forms of re repression. Uh, so first a note uh, on why digital migration. Uh, for me, this is a way to address uh, kind of the emergent interdisciplinary discussions across fields, including media, communication, uh, uh, migration studies, refugee studies, but also geography, anthropology, and uh, science and technology studies, all addressing forms and interrelations uh, between uh, fields of migration, uh, uh, between domains of migration uh, and the digital. Uh, and for me, uh, uh, this uh, brings with us uh, particularly four uh, concerns or questions uh, on the level of ontology, at the level of epistemology, methodology, uh, and ethics. Uh, so first, focusing on ontology, it allows for us to critically scrutinize uh, the interrelated conditions, the political, socioeconomic, historical, uh, cultural, technological, and ideological to which migrants are produced uh, as uh, datafied subjects uh, through forms of governmentality from top down, for example, uh, but also through uh, uh, engaging in digital networks, uh, social media, digital devices. Uh, secondly, the fields of migration and media studies both also find themselves at a the critical juncture, uh, which is then uh, also apparent in discussions on uh, the digitization of migration. For example, in migration research, scholars are still searching uh, for ways to come to terms with the shortcomings and also limitations uh, uh, of the dominant disciplinary focus uh, on the role of the nation state, as well as the ethnic lens. In media communication research, we see very much a pendulum swing between uh, digital media centric, di digital data driven approaches uh, versus uh, more non-media centric, uh, human centric approaches. Uh, which are both competing for interest uh, across different paradigms in the field. Uh, and thirdly, uh, on the level of methodology, we see how this uh, top-down uh, 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 engagement with migration datafies migrant subjects, but also how it is, creates new digital data sets. Also social media use, digital device use, creates new dig digital data sets. Uh, which allows for new uh, methodological innovation, but it also raises uh, a number of really important ethical questions, particularly around the digi digitization of mobile subjects, around data privacy, but also on the development and uh, deployment uh, in academia of specific categories of migration and mobility. So this uh, more conceptual uh, engagement is also very much based in a long uh, term commitment to field work. So many of the questions that I'm engaging with here uh, are really also uh, drawn from field work experiences. Uh, so over the course of the last decade or so, I've been uh, fortunate enough to engage in field work with uh, over 250 young people of migration, refugee, expatriate, uh, and various mobility backgrounds. And these are uh, some of the commitments that also uh, seek to uh, mobilize here in this presentation. But let me turn to the four paradoxes that are to the three paradoxes, sorry, uh, that I'd like to discuss with you here to come to terms with this uh, 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 very much uh, diverging uh, discussions and practices uh, of migrant connectivity through the digital. Uh, first, uh, I would like to point you to, the, uh, uh, to an important conceptual intervention in the field, uh, which is uh, uh, the Manifesto on the Connected Migrants, written by Dana Diminescu in, Fran in France, uh, in, in the French language in 2005, then translated into English in uh, 2008, uh, which really uh, set, uh, set the debate on migrant connectivity. Uh, in her work, she addresses how the figure of the connected migrant uh, uh, moves beyond seeing ruptures and seeing continuities, but looking at co-presence. So she addresses how migrants can engage in, in transnational forms of communication while also engaging and being present in their local communities. But uh, she, in her work, she mobilizes uh, the, the, the image of Ruben's face. She introduces this, uh, this image uh, to challenge uh, our limited uh, uh, ability to come to terms and to use uh, a separate uh, uh, 
dual perspectives in, in analyzing migrant connectivity. And I think she's very right in arguing that, for example, when you look at Ruben's face, you either see CF, CFAs or you see two inward looking uh, faces. And similarly, she argues when you look at the literature, uh, there's a lot of focus either on integration, on how the digital and, and networks are used to integrate in local societies, or the attention is uh, uh, put on uh, forms of uh, uh, transnational engagement. And very often these are pitted against each other. And we, we can see this also in the literature when we look, for example, at the differentiation between research on so-called ethnic community and diaspora media versus intercultural media uh, for, versus encapsulation and cosmopolitanization, or for example, the literature on bonding versus bridging capital in studies on migrant connectivity. So we see here how uh, very often uh, separate lenses are used, uh, which are seen as antagonistic, as not being compatible. Uh, and in line with Dimonescu's already early uh, contribution, I think this oppositional framing is strongly limited. So how can we overcome and also question uh, this kind of uh, oppositional view and this limited, uh, uh, limited view? We can draw, draw here, I think, uh, on the migration scholars Erdal and Uppen, who have uh, engaged with this dynamic uh, to the notion of migrant balancing act and presenting a typology exactly of how uh, to invite migration scholars uh, and scholars uh, outside, outside the field of migration to acknowledge the coexistence of transnationalism and integration as a praxis simultaneously, but also to uh, uh, analyze the interactions uh, between the two. So they propose this interaction can be understood as a place, as being place and context specific, uh, but also as resulting from functional, emotional and pragmatic considerations. Uh, so there are at least four ways in which we can address this relationship between transnationalism and integration in migrant connectivity networks. Uh, first is being overlooked, uh, which we can see in the majority of literature actually, an antagonistic framing, uh, so uh, uh, seeing the two as opposite, an additive approach and a synergistic approach. And I'll just give brief examples of these four uh, to tease out the dynamics of this first paradox. Uh, so when we uh, look at the literature, uh, which focuses on either transnationalism or either integration uh, in addressing migrant connectivity networks, I'm not saying that these studies are somehow not legit uh, or not uh, informative. Actually, they bring us uh, a lot of uh, uh, conceptual baggage to critically account for processes. For example, in the field of transnationalism, we see how, for example, notions like transnational habitus is developed in a study on Romanian professionals in, in Toronto, Canada, to refer to everyday realities uh, of digitally mediated simultaneously and simultaneous and immediate border crossings, or the restaging of family rituals at a distance by Sarah Marino, which uh, alerts us to how video-based culinary practices uh, among transnational Italian families happen. Uh, and similarly, we can speak about ambient co-presence uh, put forward by uh, Madian. Uh, from the integration paradigm, si similarly, we've seen uh, the development of strong studies uh, pointing at the dynamics specifically around digital integration or the use of digital networks on the local level. For example, how WhatsApp uh, was used by internally displaced persons in Nigeria to achieve a sense of uh, social inclusion in the study by Dasuki and Abu Bakr. However, uh, what happens when we bring the two together? In a lot of studies, when the two are brought together, uh, scholars address uh, uh, how these are uh, actually in opposition, so how they are uh, working in an antagonistic uh, relationship. For example, in her ethnography with Korean transient migrants in Austin, Texas, Shinya Lee contends that if someone, and I quote, tends to consume homeland media dominantly, that person ends up decreasing hostland media consumption rather than reducing other leisure activities. Similarly, in a study uh, with Polish and Filipino migrants living in Ireland, Lee Komito argues network connectivity reshapes migration experience but he also warns that staying in touch transnationally potentially then also results in slowing down processes of integration and participation in host societies. 
It should be noted that in particularly in studies on elites and expatriates and sojourners, we very often see these uh, conclusions. But it's striking that in these studies, uh, these implications are very uh, often not uh, scrutinized. We see in public discourse a lot of scrutiny on transnational forms of uh, com uh, communication, uh, on transnational media use among refugees, uh, among asylum seekers, uh, and which is very often highly politicized, such as the refugee taking uh, uh, refugee or the selfie taking refugee, for example, which is uh, highly visible in, in public discourse, but very often expatriate practices, uh, which are indicating a sense of segregation, uh, are not scrutinized. A third uh, way of engaging with this relationship between transnationalism and integration in studying uh, migrant connectivity networks is the additive approach. So here we can take cues from scholars uh, seeking to engage with migrants' double engagement, double consciousness, or double orientations. Here, uh, there's a body of work which addresses how, for example, engaging on the transnational level uh, uh, produces a sense of security, of ontological security, as a basis to also uh, find courage, strength, and emotional support to engage in local context, so to establish new connections on the local level uh, of integration. And we can think here, for example, of studies by Amelia Georgiou, by Elias and uh, Lemesh uh, uh, in, in Israel, as well as Liam and Piam in Singapore how uh, social media on the transnational level and the local level might offer a space of acculturation. So the for, uh, a fourth, uh, a fourth approach to engage uh, on the, the, with the question of transnationalism and integration uh, takes a synthetic approach. Here we can see uh, uh, there's only a limited engagement and people are just starting to take the two uh, into account as uh, hybridizing. Uh, but for example, uh, uh, studies in queer diasporas and queer migrant studies have found uh, a very promising results. For example, in the study by Cassidy and Wang, uh, but also, for example, the study by Jay and Marlowe, uh, who, whose work on refugees in New Zealand uh, demonstrated exactly the interplay between uh, local connectivity and transnational connectivity. Uh, I'm happy to dwell on this further, but just taking uh, the time into account, I'm now moving on to the second paradox. Uh, so a second level uh, of research uh, uh, on, uh, in migrant connectivity, uh, which takes two, uh, very often two paradoxical uh, uh, thematic entry points, uh, which is the question around information and around information practices, which is a paradox revolving around the question to what extent migration, networking, inclusion is an information problem, uh, in the words of Kaidi and Allard. And the short answer to this question, yes, when unfulfilled information needs might uh, pose barriers to social cultural adaptation. Uh, for example, Marzuku and Burnett showed in the study uh, conducted in 2018. And navigating a new landscape uh, for refugees, expatriates, and uh, other transnational mobile subjects may involve satisfying information needs around, for example, language, employment, housing, health, education, transportation, banking, but also compliance with uh, local regulations. Here's an example of how we can come to terms uh, in the specific context of, uh, of refugee information practices uh, with a, a, a very uh, a wide array of actors, stakeholders, and domains uh, information practices pertain to. Uh, pertain to. This is an information uh, needs matrix uh, produced by Olu Bukola uh, Udutan and Ian Rutfen, uh, which uh, provides us understanding on the situated information experiences. But uh, when we then take a next step in uh, situating this in uh, conceptual debates around information uh, uh, practices, uh, we can take cues from two, uh, uh, from a continuum uh, where on one side of the continuum, uh, very uh, a, a more pessimistic account uh, is mobilized in the words of, in the work of uh, Lloyd uh, with the concept of fractures in information landscapes and the work of Melissa Wong and colleagues addressing uh, situations of information precarity uh, which uh, violates for example the rights to information uh, of refugees living uh, in uh, refugee camps in this case in Melissa's study in Zatari in Jordan. 
And this perspective of how uh, people are uh, uh, facing obstacles in negotiating migrant connectivity networks, so are actually uh, uh, feeling uh, uh, excluded because they lack a right of information is highly uh, sharply contrasted with studies uh, that focus on uh, uh, how uh, migrants themselves have developed uh, a way to overcome these barriers and obstacles. For example, in the work of Papadopoulos and Cianos, uh, they mobilized the, the conceptual framework of the migrant mobile commons as an alternative uh, peer produced and horizontal uh, way of addressing uh, information uh, shortcomings and shortages and information voids. Uh, similarly, in a study uh, by Rianne Decker uh, and colleagues uh, among Syrian refugees in the Netherlands, they come up with the term smart refugee to account specifically for the way in which uh, uh, peer produced, peer to peer uh, information networks on social media and WhatsApp networks, for example, are used uh, to, for example, verify. Uh, 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 verify governmental information, rumors, uh, and circulating within networks. And this uh, aligns with some of uh, the public discourse around how social media uh, is popularized as a sort of trip advisor for refugees. Uh, and I would advocate that in studying information practices, we can take cues from both of these sides because very often there are situations of information precarity, but there are also peer produced. Uh, answers to these forms of precarity. Let me just move to the third uh, paradox, uh, which uh, uh, which uh, revolves around the paradox of uh, claiming uh, using migrant networks to claim human rights versus how these uh, uh, claims of human rights and how these migrant networks are also the target uh, and uh, subject to forms of repression by the state, but also internally to diasporas. We can take you here uh, from uh, the autonomy of migration network, uh, autonomy of migration framework, critical border studies, but also uh, digital citizenship uh, scholarship, particularly by Anjan Eason. He speaks about how the digital can be mobilized to pursue openings and closings. And along this line uh, of how the digital is used to, uh, to claim human rights, we can take uh, uh, and take a look at emerging scholarship uh, on, for example, the notion of self-represented witnessing uh, uh, of refugees in the offshore uh, detention centers in Australia, Ludek Stavinoa's uh, work on communicative acts of citizenship among Greek, uh, among refugees in Greek uh, uh, refugee camps, but also notions of digital diaspora diplomacy of how uh, uh, of how migrants are uh, in uh, are are reclaiming uh, forms of dip diplomacy from below. We also see how uh, within queer diasporas and queer migration networks, uh, forms of activism are mobilized in the work of O2. So I'm drawing to a close, I'm looking at the, at the time. Uh, in, in answers to these uh, human rights claims, uh, we see also how various forms of both top-down state uh, instrumentalized forms uh, of auto authoritarianism are enacted. For example, Moss describes how Syrian activists worldwide uh, are, uh, uh, are surveilled in the diaspora uh, uh, through the notions of extraterritorial authoritarian practices, but also how authoritarianism is networked within a diaspora. So how members uh, internal to diasporas also uh, engage in surveillance and control within uh, diasporas. So this is uh, what I wanted to share with you here. Uh, I've addressed three paradoxes to come to terms with the many different sides of migrant connectivity, and I hope this overview will pre prove useful uh, in our discussions. Looking forward to uh, the fellow uh, uh, panelist interventions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Cohen. Uh, that was a really good, that was a very interesting topic. Uh, uh, and thank you for presenting all those uh, three paradoxes uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the migration literature. Um, so our next speaker is, is Urban, Urban Cabalquinto. Uh, is he? Oh, he's here. Hi. Urban, you can uh, share your screen if, if you like. There we go. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you. Let me just increase my volume and set this into presentation. So I reckon I can now actually start my presentation. Yes. 
I will. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you very much for having me here um, to present my work on um, digital media and migration, particularly looking at the context of Filipino migrants in Australia and how they use digital communication technologies to sustain to their left behind family members in the Philippines. So it's quite interesting because there's no study yet conducted, particularly in Australia, looking at the case of Filipino migrants and their left behind family members using this wide range or an ecosystem of digital communication technologies and online platforms for forging and maintaining um, intimate and transnational ties. So for this presentation, I'll be talking about my paper on what I call the immobile gaze, playing around with the idea of mobility and immobility and looking at the gaze of questioning who is actually looking and how this particular way of looking or portraying constructing the migrant might um, raise issues on you know, methods um, might raise issues on ethics of governing mobile subjects, but also thinking about the benefits and risk, you know, that might arise from this particular gaze that are, you know, that's performed in online spaces. So I, I particularly look at this paper uh, thinking about the governance and economies of intimate transnational ties in a digital era. Um, before I start my presentation, a bit of background about myself. Um, I do research on digital media um, practices of um, migrants and their left behind family members, particularly approaching these practices through a mobility lens. Um, what do I mean by this one? Mobility lens will be focusing on how movements with digital communication technologies, social media platforms, and mobile applications facilitate those intimate, um, meaningful, and sometimes you know ruptured and disconnected and unstable um, relationships in that space. I'm very particular with theorizing how um, do these practices are actually informed by political, economic, social, and even technological factors that contribute to my to our approach of this nuance thinking of digital practices among migrants. Okay, so setting the scene. Um, I'm a Filipino. <laughs> I'm originally from the Philippines, and I moved to Australia to do my PhD, and eventually stayed here. So um, I'm very um, into that space of and familiar. I embodied my research. You know, I'm a migrant. I moved to another country and tried to experience and live my experiences as a migrant. I do send money back home, use uh, mobile applications to connect to my father. You know, connect um, to my friends and family members through Facebook, WhatsApp. Mention it, and I actually use them. And in particular, looking at these practices um, while doing my research on Filipino migrants and my embodied experience as well, I, I, I really think about that the Philippines is really, you know, on a labor exporting country. So there's actually a joke um, running around that if you actually go to the moon, you'll be probably seeing a Filipino working because we're everywhere. <laughs> we're actually working everywhere and you're part of this global workforce. Um, currently, um, there's actually 2.3 uh, million overseas Filipino workers um, spread across the world. And this kind of mobility and emplacement of Filipino workers um, in various countries um, across the globe is actually um, rooted through this historicized uh, kind of like context wherein um, in the past um, by signing this Washington consensus from the United States, um, the Philippines eventually open into um, economic deregulation, privatization, and liberalization. So the Philippines was used to be a colony of the United States and remaining a neo-colonial state um, in relation to these policies of you know, control of um, the, the power in um, developed countries and stuff. So with this um, signing of uh, policies, ordinary Filipinos were actually um, denied from accessing you know, um, basic job opportunities and increased kind of like um, unemployment, underemployment, and also cases of poverty in that, state, that case. Um, migration was actually seen by the Philippine government as a supposedly temporary, but eventually turned into a permanent stopgap measure for an escalating economic instability. So there's really lacking um, job opportunities back home, which you know, compelling um, Filipinos to move overseas and find jobs. And this historically um, situated um, condition of the Philippine workers moving overseas and living overseas to support their family members is actually informed by the signing of the Labor Code of 1974 by our former President Ferdinand Marcos. It's really promoted in the country with all of these programs and trainings for Filipino workers to think about their capacity to be ideal workers of the world. And this construction of being an ideal worker is actually reinforced through training, certifications, and other programs, which I'll be talking about because this is powerful when I think about who is actually creating the gaze 
for this particular mobility and this mobility reinforcing immobilities of existing political and economic systems that often create the conditions for migrants. Okay, so constructing the ideal Filipino migrant would actually be linked um, to the presence of agencies and embassies, um, often transnationally coordinated, um, embedded in place in various countries, in the Philippines, also across the world. And uh, the, these agencies kind of like train um, Filipino workers and manufacture Filipino workers as embodying export added value. So meaning we speak English well, we're actually manufactured as very flexible and very hardworking as well. And in terms of that construction, this, this ideal of uh, practices of being a good and submissive and very flexible worker is actually rewarded by different awards. So there's so many awards in the Philippines, for example, um, um, OFW Family of the Year or you know, other forms of um, recognitions in that space. And particularly, you probably heard of this one. Um, Filipino workers are actually called modern heroes of the Philippines because of the remittances sent by these workers to the country, contributing to 10% of the gross domestic product of the nation state. And it's not only about having these agencies, embassies supporting or kind of like creating this um, construction, but also the embeddedness of uh, Filipino workers across the globe, but also the construction of that particular subjectivity reinforced through popular mass media. For example, if you'll see in my slide, I have two examples of films here. One is a caregiver and one is anak or child. These two films, particularly construct this migrant as, you know, a hardworking, very gendered as well, you know, as a mother of working overseas, caring for the family back home through communication um, channels, through sending money, and also um, visits, you know, as part of that journey of becoming a mother again in a physical space. Um, I'm sorry. And when we think about this idea of the constructing of the ideal Filipino migrant, it's actually now what I'm arguing is extended in online platforms. So in my recent publication, which I'll be talking about shortly, the construction of this uh, particular um, migrant is not only about you know, being flexible, hardworking, or kind of like um, really um, can speak English to accommodate the needs of a uh, global you know, demand of the workforce and stuff, but it's also extended in the idea that you become an ideal um, migrant worker or a Filipino by using digital communication technologies. And this construction is actually forging you to send money and care packages back home to your family members. And the construction is actually reinforced by the idea that you can become um, that ideal mother, ideal father, ideal sibling for your family through all of this digitalized and media practices. If you're actually looking at my screen at the moment, I have two screenshots of uh, particular websites in here. The first one is actually from LDC. It's basically highlighting, encouraging workers to actually send money. And later I'll be talking about this act of encouraging, connect, these words of connecting, sharing, moving um, pa packages and products and stuff are actually um, kind of like related to the idea that you become that ideal Filipino worker who provides for the family and provides for the nation state. And this other um, screenshot in here, it's called Balink Bayan. It's a website um, produced by the government highlighting that you can actually get services here, like if you need documents about the Philippines, if you want to invest uh, to the Philippines, if you want to retire to the Philippines, you can find all of this information here. But more particularly, this website is actually articulating the idea that you can be part of the Philippine government's nation building. So the migrant here is no longer kind of like only connecting the family members, but a part of the narrative, a part of the me mechanism for nation building. And this is important because this is a gaze that's being constructed historically from agencies, offices, embassies, promotional materials, and now moving into online spaces. And then we think about the intimate transnational economies. So these economies are not only governed, um, or I mean like relationships, but also economized. And OFWs in these spaces are actually coded as being responsible family members, you know, activated um, through sending money and consumer goods, you know, being entrepreneurs, investors, and partners for national development. But what's more fascinating about these mechanisms of encouraging uh, migrants to perform that ideal subjectivity would be the appropriation, take note of this one, of social cultural values and expectations. We're in filial piety, you know, being um, supportive, respectful for your family members, being altruistic, you know, you self-sacrifice for your family members, for the nation, 
can actually be rewarded in this space. And this is used by the government to con construct that idea that you perform all of these practices, you know, digitalized, commercials, mediated and stuff. But at the same time, what problematic in this space, it's reinforcing that economic and political system that's actually fueling that flow of um, migrants and placing them in that particular locality in, uh, you know, across the countries. So um, I'm drawing and building on this idea of the immobile gaze um, from my previous publication. It's called Migrant Platform Subjectivity, Rethinking the Mediation of Transnational Effective Economies by Digital Connectivity Services. So as part of a collaborative work, um, we examined commercial and government online services, comparing LBC, Western Union, and Balink Bayan. We did a walkthrough method and critical discourse analysis of these platforms particularly looking at the terms and conditions were in kind of like overlook when you took, when think about using platforms. Um, by looking at these um, terms and conditions uh, or privacy statement and stuff, we realized that these platforms are actually collecting data and this data are actually being um, sold to third parties. So once you use all of these remittance apps, they're actually collecting, harvesting our online um, data and they're being sold to different parties. What's actually fascinating in our research um, Facebook is actually thinking of creating a remittance platform because they're now able to track um, these conversations among migrants through WhatsApp of exchanging messages of already send you money. You can actually check your Western Union account. So that's giving opportunity for Facebook to think about this digitalization and investing on kind of like economized spaces for um, transnational ties. So the mechanisms um, deployed by these commercial and government channels would be constructing the migrant as an economic subject. So you'll be able to send money, consume um, items, send what we call care packages. At the same time, it's constructing the migrant as a valued clientele. So meaning you are provided with rewards by how many times that you send money, care packages. You get to be part of what we call um, sort of like um, what we call supporting people and communities and programs in the Philippines. But more importantly, we look at these channels as a profitable marketplace. So it's no longer hanging around, sending money, care packages, or accessing government documents, but it's become a profitable space for commercial um, platforms, particularly through um, the, 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 the things that you send and your the commodification of our personal data. But for government um, platforms, thinking about presenting the condition of the Philippines through data. For example, we need 300 shares in these particular classrooms. We need um, to develop here if you want to invest here. So using the data to create value and invite migrants to become partners for national development. And this is very interesting because it's facilitating that sustenance of the communication between Filipino migrants, family members, and the homeland. So here are some um, screenshots from um, our research. Particularly, for example, when you look at LBC, you can see that to sign up for a mobile application is actually prompting you to go to Facebook. So again, it, this is not only kind of like having a platform independent, operationalized by tech companies, uh, I mean like by commercial companies, but it's actually in sync with other platforms, for example, Facebook. So you go through Facebook, you deposit your information, um, identifiable information, and then you use the platform. So it's allowing not only the commercial platform, LBC, to get your information and know what they're doing, but also what we call Facebook. <laughs> so it's kind of like really an ecosystem of tracking practices, movements in there. And it's capitalizing on this idea of constructing the ideal worker, I mean, like Filipino worker, because you're able to send money back home and stuff like that. Um, another screenshot um, on my screen, you can see that there's this um, screenshot from the website from Balink Bayan saying, invest in the Philippines. So it's really encouraging migrants to promote, to invest into the country in terms of like um, through donations, through thinking about uh, projects in regional areas or other states. But also I'll show later a screenshot of encouraging these migrants to test or to acquire points to become entrepreneurs. Okay, so you actually take tests through this online um, channel and then you get to acquire certain points of saying that, okay, you're actually eligible and you're ready to invest and you're really qualified to invest um, to projects in the Philippines. So this is fascinating because for the first um, case study, we can see that um, our data can actually be sold to unknown third parties, raising questions on you know, um, ethics of you know, harvesting our data. But at the same time, 
you, the other um, case study here would be showcasing that you can actually earn points based on frequency of transactions or identifying problems in the Philippines through um, the data that you get to see as exposed in these online channels. So by reflecting on these practices, I actually thought that there's something happening here in terms of the construction of the ideal worker, ideal Filipino worker. And I'm conceptualizing this idea of the immobile gaze, where in the digital communication technology is not only used you know, for a technology of the self, for self-improvement, but rather maintaining meaningful and sustained connections at a distance through this um, use of communication channels, sending money, care packages, and investing in various business ventures. And the migrant subjectivity in here is actually constructed and reinforced by the Philippine government through various mechanisms. So traversing this kind of tech from agencies, having awards, and now online platforms for providing connectivity services. More importantly, it's the appropriation of what I call the social cultural values in Philippine society. So the government and commercial platforms, they're capitalizing on this nationalist discourse. You send money, you invest in the Philippines, you become a good ambassador of the country. And at the same time, by you know, supporting your family members because there's no support from the government for your family members in the Philippines, you perform this filial, perform this very uh, altruistic kind of like characteristic. And it's being appropriated in narratives of platforms you know, of agencies and also award-giving bodies. And what's the problem in this one? It's actually, it might absolve the government in providing job opportunities and social welfare services to its citizens because you are actually performing that supportive role for your family members and to the nation. And uh, interestingly, it can immobilize that hierarchy and the exploitation in Philippine society wherein you do all of these practices to support the, fam the family, the communities, the nation, but at the same time, we think that, okay, those who are actually seated in power, this is their imaginaries, that it can exploit workers in that space, and they can actually escape from doing their job in providing opportunities for their citizens. And when you think about um, these practices happening around through discursive mechanisms, representations, um, construction of um, subjectivities, there's an ethical implication in this space because online activities are actually capturing and utilizing all of our data for commercial and government aims. As I mentioned earlier, when you think about um, LBC Western Union, you know, harvesting all of this information and getting to understand our connections um, to our family members, to the homeland. And for the government, um, utilizing the data to perform this kind of like um, positioning of the migrant worker as part of the nation building instead of them working on their way to support their um, citizens. And also methodological implications. Um, as a researcher, so it was interesting because when I published the paper, um, we were taking screenshots, but we didn't include them to the paper because as we all know, you can't just, this is an important part in terms of doing social media research. You can't just grab information out there that you feel like it's publicly accessible. So you still need to get consent in terms of like publishing those items. So I didn't publish them um, for publications. But more importantly, the, the methodological implication for this one is actually us not knowing that through the terms and conditions that it might not be reading, they're actually harvesting our information in that space. And we don't know that. And it's also reinforcing that an equal power relation that they're capitalizing on our data for commercial purposes and other purposes. And then the impact of this um, construction, basically it's promoting the use of digital communication technologies to sustain those relationships, to sustain transnational ties, but also creating what we call transnational household. But the risk could be like, we can be um, opening our data to these platforms and they, they can actually be tracking what we're doing in these online spaces in that regard. But for the government agencies, they can actually use the data to show the value that actually, if you invest in the Philippines, you can actually do this. You can contribute to the need, for example, a lot of um, chairs for classrooms, for redevelopment and other um, projects in the country. Key points um, before I wrap up my um, presentation, just highlighting that online channels are actually social artifacts according to um, Light versus NY, highlighting that these um, platforms are actually operationalized through economic, social, and political frames. Uh, when we look at, for example, um, LBC, Western Union, and other um, government platforms, they're actually shaped not only because it's providing that services to connect these first family members, but it's actually there's a particular goal of you know earning profit, commodifying data, but at the same time, creating this narrative for migrant workers to be part of nation building. And 
this is actually allowing um, positively for migrants to connect, to sustain connections. But more importantly, um, it's reinforcing that economic and kind of like political systems in that space. And what's actually fascinating in here, so it's strengthening, perpetuating the idea of the idea of that the migrant workers are really the lifeblood for the nation state in constantly confronting economic and political crises. And when we think about this gaze that I'm talking about, we think about the imaginaries of those who are in power and reinforcing those systems and mobilizing those systems that kind of like create the environment and conditions for you know, exploitation and abuse for those who are actually in marginalized conditions. And I think that's all for my presentation today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Irvin. Thanks a lot for that very interesting presentation on the digital commodification of migrants and uh, migrants' data. Uh, our next presentation is from Priya Kumar. Um, Priya, you can share your screen. Okay. And, and, okay. All right. Let's give this a go. I was having, oh, there we go. Okay, perfect. Is this, there we go. All right. So, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Priya Kumar, and I'm here uh, to talk a bit about social network analysis in evidence-based uh, decision-making, particularly in the context of migration. Um, and so what we see today is that we, we're talking about digital technologies, different platforms, social media. And so we're kind of recognizing here that there is a, a role being played uh, when we think about how people connect, um, how they share their interests, their identities, cultural affinities, you know, we, we look at language tutorials these days or recipes through our, through our Instagrams. Um, and we are, we're starting to be a bit more critical on apps, particularly when we talk about refugees, for example. So we're starting to be a bit more critical with how we think about evidence and decisions. Um, so what we, you know, uh, leading into the other, other uh, uh, discussion points is that migrants have always tried to connect, whether it's through letters, whether it's through Skype, um, even today when we look at dating networks and apps. Um, what, we, what we start to see is that migrants are part of this ecosystem as well, even in how we receive our news about migrants and, and, and crises, right? There's evidence in news often based on mediated conversations and then also in politicized online discourse as, as uh, the other participants had mentioned. So very broadly, and I have some general objectives with my talk, I, I'm interested in looking at the intersection of migration and digital tech, uh, trying to really highlight and explain that this is a complex and an unstable environment defined by mobility in one way or another. When we think about host homeland or here and there or, or countries of origin and settlement, Coupled with this unit of analysis, you know, we think about essentializing groups. That's a lot of different variables for us to think about. Um, so uh, when we think about also um, this approach, we're, we're looking at different layers of media centricness. And I found that this was a really useful uh, metaphor that uh, Cohen mentioned before. So broadly, when I'm, when I'm talking today and some of the examples that I'm going to bring out, I really want to try and highlight that we need a critical approach to evidence and what that means in decision making. We want to understand and recognize that there is something about doing research through and by means of the internet, um, which are new, new variables for a lot of people in this field. Uh, we want to think about what other uh, methodologies we can supplement with quantitative research, because we want to acknowledge that there is this push for quantitative data as, as, as more evidence-based, but really that might not be the case for the type of work that we do. And that might not be the case broadly. So there's a lot of critical questions of what type of data we're using. Um, in that lens, when we think about media and we're looking at social networks, maybe we're thinking about different types of patterns of behavior, communication networks, relationships. And ultimately, this really uh, focuses on being able to maybe splice and dice the, the migrant journey from you know, before, during, and after, and maybe being able to look at that integration question a bit more. So ultimately, we're really recognizing that there's powers in technologies, 
that a local context might matter more than we've been able to think about or use with certain toolkits. And that we're trying to even enhance our, our, our methodological toolkit while doing this research. But I think really importantly, I wanna highlight that we as researchers, we give evidence importance as well, right? And when we're talking about migrant communities, uh, we're talking about often vulnerable or marginalized groups where power is, is often part of this conversation. And so I really do think that um, the other participants have really highlighted this and I, and, and I, and I think that's something that we can, we can expand on. So here's the million dollar question, if not billion dollar question. Um, you know, migrants and, and migrant issues are, are woven across digital technologies today. So really what is evidence, right? Uh, when we use evidence from the beginning, it requires a solid critical research design, right? So here are some ex examples and there are various studies um, that have been done on various threads of this. So platform-based studies where you have these nodes, these dots, I'll show you some examples of that uh, in a minute. And you're looking at hyperlinks or different types of connections, asking why they're connected. So you can compare how different migrant communities might use different platforms and why they're linking, whether it be for Q&A or whether it be for um, some sort of uh, nationalist endeavor. You can, you can also look at um, infrastructure-based studies. So this often is top-down work when it's examining um, witnessing of refugee use of apps, let's say, and, and how effective it is. Is it really? We don't, we don't know yet. We're still kind of getting into that phase. Um, then there's other questions of even methodological additions uh, to this very new area, right? So we can do ethnographies of migrant protests. What's the discourse uh, today? How are handheld devices being used? Um, you know, we can talk about cultural artifacts and, and recipes and, and, and those types of things and also look more at group, ba uh, group uh, based analyses that often we haven't looked at right so localized context again, but again, these are all evidence based research based on some form of a social network right and so it reminds me of the paradigm approach that Cohen has, has put forth in some of his work of looking at migrants, let's say in an online context versus, you know, a practice of everyday life. So, you know, we, we think about those chat rooms uh, back in the day and understanding that there are also migrants as data. So the e diaspora Atlas, which I was a member of, and I'm going to talk about that would be something like that. And so really broadly, when we think about this, this idea of evidence, maybe we're thinking about different actors or prominent actors, new gatekeepers or issue agendas, um, and also uh, different relationships between the local domestic and the transnational. The other point that I want to highlight here is that evidence in this context is often much more expressive. It can be visual, it can be affective. And so really it highlights the need for supplementary methods that we can inject some, some context. Um, and that's where I really want to make clear that, you know, there's this romanticized ideal of data and what it can afford us. But, you know, the local context often in this type of work is, is, is incredibly important. So the point with this, this slide is to really show you is that to analyze and to measure a change or a phenomena in migration processes from the very onset, we as researchers, we make choices. And we do this and who we, oh, oh, is my, I have, I, am I being interrupted here? Oops. Hello, am I being, was I interrupted? Okay. So um, the point that I'm trying to say here is that when you measure a change or a phenomena from the very onset, you're trying to make choices. Uh, you make choices in who you interview, uh, what responses that you show. And this is critical in social media research as it is for, for other forms of research. But I find that from the beginning, we have the opportunity to really uh, think through a design, right? So I'm going to give an example here of Oh, there we go. This is from the e Diaspora's Atlas, uh, which I was a researcher from. Um, so this was with Dana Dominiscu's team um, coming out of France. And so uh, there are uh, around thir just under 30 atlases, and I produced three of them. Uh, and I, I mapped out around 1,200 websites. And so just to give you some context here, a node or would be a website here, and, uh, and a hyperlink would, would be a connection, 
okay? Just to give you some context. And so this is a network visualization of three stateless communities. And so for this project, I was interested in looking at how online identity politics is being performed, right? And so this is a visualization of relations between websites, uh, but also you can understand this, it, it could quite literally be a visualization of, of a spreadsheet, right? Because really what we're doing is we're looking at two columns or two or three columns and looking at the relationships that we've tried to focus on in the beginning to visualize that spreadsheet. I know one of the common questions is, you know, what do these maps mean? But really we decide those based on the relationships that we've, we've started to focus on from the beginning, right? So we don't know much. Uh, if, if, I, if I ask you to think about what you might know about, about this online migrant community, what, what would you say? You would say maybe the Palestinian atlas is denser. That's about it. We, we don't know much without the context. This evidence is quite limited without the researcher guiding us to really tell that story. So this starts to make a little bit more sense, right? So the same, same um, um, atlases were coded for, for language, and this is all available online. Um, and so for every website, I, made a, I, I developed a coding scheme in the beginning of my work. And the, the aim of this was to offer insight into how communities uh, are connected and what, what issues and agendas really connect people across borders, right? Um, and they might manifest differently in local context versus online context. So this data visualization, I'll go over it for you now. Um, so what, what you see is on both ends, the Sikh and the Palestinian uh, communities, uh, their representations in the, at least the online context shows a dominance of English language. What I found most striking in the, in the Tamil case study that I completed was that around 57% of the websites were in, were in English strictly, okay? And that would be here, all right? And I was only able to, to really glean this from this, this data by making the decision before that language might be something that can tell us a bit about integration in a local context. We can learn a bit about the community. We can learn a bit about the migration story. It can be an entry point to further, further questions. And so this is another point of what, why evidence matters. There's a secondary question of what other languages would we expect to be there and yet are not. So again, being critical with what's, what, what information we have, but also what is not presented. So what I found striking was that in the SIC uh, mapping, any website that was in Punjabi also was in English and it was under 10%. In the Palestinian graph, uh, there was much more of a global representation. Uh, Arabic, French, Spanish, D uh, Dutch, for example, were quite prevalent. And again, it starts to right away highlight, you know, maybe issues or agendas in, in these communities, whether they are communities or whether they are, are, are political issues, right? And that was really what started to come out in the Palestinian case, that it wasn't the Palestinian diaspora, rather, the core issues of, of, of a conflict rooted in, in, in a physical territory, right? And that was not the case in, in the Tamil uh, 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 mapping activity as well. Um, so you can follow up with questions of boundary making or in and out group um, activities. You can start to ask, are, are these activities uh, that are happening on these websites focused on political mobilization? In what context? Is it about community representation? Uh, in the Sikh case, there was a lot of religious congregation websites, scripture, for example. So the reasons why communities engage, we were able to kind of start to pick at a thread uh, from language. And I think that that's the, like what I thought was, was, um, was, was really interesting there. Um, the other point that I would add with anything to do with social networks, what I have found is that comparative work can really be your friend. It's very helpful to when you ask a how and why question, um, because we don't know what the data is, well, in theory, we hope we don't know necessarily what the data is going to tell us, but comparative work can help us to set up a little bit of a yardstick around a framing. In this case, it was that there are, there are three stateless communities, that's all they have in common, uh, and then that's it. And then that was the variable to kind of try and test and see if there were similarities and differences. So adding a set, an, another context, and I think that this is really important, is that you, know, you want to look to other types of data to give meaning, right? So I treated in this, in this, um, in this study 
looking at language as the thread for further research, right? And so what I found is that in the interviews that I conducted, um, the, many of the respondents, um, first of all, they viewed their online presence as their moral obligation to a political cause. So it was a much more family based on uh, you know, grievances. It was much more about being disenfranchised, as you can see on the top, that losing language rights, representation. And so it's much more of an active choice uh, to be insular with language. By contrast, in the, in, in the, at least with the Palestinian respondents, first of all, it was, a, it was much more of a mixed group of respondents. And there was also a, a generational thread that came out. And that was quite similar in the, in, the, in the Sikh community as well, that it was learning how to speak. You might not know how to read or write, but you can kind of make your way. But again, what you see is that, is that um, you have this politicized language and then you have also this, these other threads of, of other processes of, of integration and also looking at community preservation and what that meant uh, really was different for each of the three. And somehow language was, was one of the unifying uh, uh, factors. So here are some methodological considerations that I think really I, I, I appreciated uh, uh, Cohn's work on this of, of thinking about what, what uh, migration and, and the digital and what it means uh, and how do we connect that. And that's taking also from a lot of STS studies as well. So when we talk about relational, I, I think that this is important when we look at a, situating yourself in an ecosystem of evidence, that there is this, this local context that starts to matter, as well as much more of a intercultural or questions of integration or diversity today have, have come up, as well as these new emerging links to transnational ties that we see even remittance structures may change as we continue, right? So between the on and offline, I, I would argue that you have almost different um, power vectors, depending on the type of technology that, that you're using and, and for, what like for what purpose, right? And then supplemented with that, in addition to that, there are questions of how, you know, your own feelings of, of race, gender, ableism, class, religion, um, nationalist sentiments, how those manifest and what technologies you would use. So this is very challenging, but also it's situating yourself that this is a cycle of, of, of mobility again and change. Uh, it leads me to the, to the other point of adaptability where you know, these are unstable uh, factors, right? When we look at migration shifts, we often look at crises or we look at even demographic realities today. And so often we find that there is, there is, there is a shift in that. And then in addition, when we look at, look at technology, it's always changing. When I was putting the slide together, there was a picture of a floppy disk. And I thought, I wanna just put it there to see who even knows what it is. So the point is that technology is always changing and often, there is a power vector that we as, we as researchers uh, have, right? That we might be privy to certain technologies because of our own privilege. We don't need to use certain technologies. Uh, we don't need to think about how, how far the landscape goes. Um, so for ethical implications, I think that we can we've talked about data. I think positionality is, is something that I've, I found really fascinating and it's insight that I've never really been able to talk about. So I wanna share it today where you're, you are still the expert in many cases, you are the digital researcher in many cases. And this positionality um, is something that I, that I found quite unique uh, in practice. So this is, this is uh, uh, I think I'm at time now. So this is the last slide and I, and I, I wanted to take time just to, just to share this where you, you know, your power dynamics also shape the way that you're gonna make choices in what evidence you use to, to guide in a certain opinion. In many cases, when you're using uh, social network uh, data, it, it could be for an organization looking to strategize or looking to improve their online presence. But also that relies on how you view technology, right? Your, your position may be, for me, I'm, I, I didn't realize I, I'm a techie until I realized I was when I started to see that not everybody else feels this passionate about technology. So this is also thinking about that. And also we're working with human beings that have their own stories that share, um, you know, often very uh, traumatic uh, uh, grievances or even, you know, have moved and gone through journeys of struggles. So um, I added this question of, uh, is the online strategy effective? And the reason I added that is that during my uh, work with this research, um, I realized as I was 
conducting interviews that I was I was considered a very young young woman researcher, and that you know my background would be part of part of the questions. And so you know having to explain you know my background was something I didn't really think about. Some of my colleagues thought about more, some thought less, but it was something that I had to be prepared to think and ask about. And in many cases, when you look at community gatekeepers, they are people that have come here and have built up a lot of a lot of the local organizations, and usually they, they are elders. And and uh, you know you hear all these really sometimes thought provoking stories. And at the end, one person and I just circled the area where their where their website was, and they asked me at the end. They said, "Are you know they were a bit critical of all of this data and and why you would have a website?" But they had it because the kids have it these days and. You know, that's what you have to do. You have no choice. There's this, like, like we heard in the last talk, that there's an expectation of, 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 of engaging online. And they said, well, are we winning at least? You know, it, are, we, are, are we doing well? And I didn't, I stopped and I said, I, I, it, it would depend on who you ask. I, you know, and again, it points to this question of, of the power where we had, a, we had a discussion for about five hours. And at the very end, whether they were winning or not was really important because I had information and whether it was true or not, it, it's that power relation. And we have to kind of keep that in mind that, that we are also sometimes much more aware of, of social networks and that they can be used for evidence uh, in, these, in these situations. And with that, I will hand it over to Stein. Thank you very much. Thank you, Priya. That was a really interesting conversation on uh, social network analysis. Uh, it's a very, very powerful lens to, to bring to migration research. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Maria Gentova. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for having me. Hi, Stain, and uh, all my co presenters from sunny Toronto. Uh, Canada, and I know that folks are from all over the place, so that's great to be with you here today. I'm going to share my slides at the same time, start talking. I'm a little bit different from folks who are were presenting because my core discipline is public administration, and you will hear that once I go through some stuff that I'm going to be sharing with you. So um, a little bit about of myself, I am um, a contract lecturer at Ryerson University, but I'm also working for um, government, for Ontario government, which is uh, an equivalent of regional government to other countries. So uh, I bring this perspective and I'm fully aware of it. Uh, I also understand my privilege and where I stand and all the assumptions that I'm making in my research. So bear with me, I'm happy to answer the questions from a more critical perspective, but I just wanted to put it up front so folks are aware of that. So what I'm going to share now is a result of my um, dissertation research. And um, because folks were mostly focusing on immigrants, I decided that because my research covered both government uh, approach to the use of social media, as well as immigrant approach, uh, I would focus for, the, for this specific presentation on the government side of thing, but I'm happy to answer any questions about how immigrants or potential migrants are using government social media. So, um, just to situate this research a little bit, there is a body of literature in public administration which is attributed to uh, the concept of e-government. And basically government literature on is uh, in a nutshell on how government can efficiently, efficiently and effectively use the technology. And at the time when I was embarking on my research, social media use in government was something that was very new. But at the same time, uh, back in 2015, when I was uh, starting to look at it, uh, there was already evidence that government agencies are creating social media accounts and are starting to use them. However, they were mostly pushing the information and not looking for any kind of uh, information back from their social media users. 
there was a lot of talk in the literature in terms of why this is happening, but the overall underlining assumption was sort of that there is a lack of understanding to what uh, social media adds to the government's communication channels. But uh, there was also a uh, kind of uh, from the public administration scholars and policy scholars perspective, the call to uh, use this technology in the spirit of open government and the approach to making government more transparent and bring it to more personalized approaches to folks who are kind of distant from the government, but nonetheless are um, interacting with the government on day-to-day -day basis to bring them into policy making and public service delivery and overall government decision making. So on the other hand, uh, when I was doing the literature review in, uh, from the immigra immigration perspective or migration research perspective, it was obvious that government as an entity was not present in migrant networks and some information that are crucial for making some decisions in terms of how to immigrate to country, uh, what are some processes that are established by governments might in some cases be substituted by some personal experiences that people are sharing, were sharing at this point. And they were uh, just sharing their advice and wisdom based on their personal uh, stories. However, this might not be the actual path that the government would um, publicize and recommend in terms of processes and procedures and so on and so forth. So this is to broader situate what I'm going to talk about now. Okay, and I cannot flip my slides. Okay, so the, my research specifically focused on uh, two immigration agencies in Canada and how government social media users are using their platforms. So uh, most of you will be familiar, if you are familiar with Canadian immigration system, with immigration citizenship and um, immigration refugees and, refugees and citizenship Canada which is the federal government agency responsible for immigration in Canada. But it also focused on the Ontario Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration, which is no longer a standalone ministry and it was absorbed into a different ministry currently. Uh, as you can see, they manage a variety of social media accounts and Canada is a bilingual country. So uh, all the accounts on the federal level that exist in English should also exist in French. Uh, so there is an interesting dynamic there. I'm not going to stop much here unless there are some questions, uh, but just wanted to point out that the uh, immigration in Canada is a joint responsibility between federal government and provinces. So uh, both levels of government have their uh, input into how immigrants are selected. In terms of the research that um, I undertook, it covered the period of uh, September 2015 to August 2016. So it's a bit dated, but I think some of the insights that uh, I got from this research are still quite valuable. Um, I did use two specific methods, uh, which uh, with, the, with the addition of uh, uh, analysis of publicly available government documents uh, that existed in terms of uh, open government policies in different countries, as well as what was um, government uh, agencies terms of references in terms of uh, how social media sites should be used by those who are using them from the user perspective. In terms of the methods, uh, I did use um, a combination of semi-structured interviews as well as social media data analysis. And I'm not going to go into details unless again there are questions uh, to what specifically 
uh, was done in terms of methodology, but definitely happy to answer any question that uh, you might have. So what I think is interesting, um, and the results here on the slide are based on the IRCC use of Twitter and Facebook account. And this is just for uh, Twitter and Facebook English accounts. It was pretty obvious that they were used for different purposes. So while Twitter was mostly used to provide feedback to the questions uh, that were received from folks who are interacting with the government agency on Twitter account, Facebook was mostly used just to provide some information and to push this information. Um, there's also a little bit of other types of activities, but the two main purposes for RCC to use its Twitter and Facebook account was to provide information and to provide answers to questions that uh, users were having and address to them. So, okay, Te technology issues again. Um, now, in terms of the interviews, I think, and I threw a couple of calls over there. I think when you ask folks who work in government about government social media use, um, you will hear a very different perspective from what they are trying to achieve with the use of social media as opposed to what folks who are using it need from them. So from government perspective, this is pretty much a marketing outreach and um, um, promotion tool that is needed to provide information uh, about government programs, uh, about some clarifications to things and so on and so forth. It was pretty obvious that for folks who were on the receiving end of this, this was definitely not why they came to social media in the first place. They would come there to get some personalized information and to seek the advice they couldn't get elsewhere. Um, however, it's um, pretty much not the reason to why government is on social media. And when the slide is going to flip, you will see the most popular reasons to why social media was used by government agencies. So as on the previous slide, as, and as is highlighted here, one of the reasons uh, for social media use was to not have as many calls to call center that the government agency would have on the, on the other, uh, for, from the, if they were, didn't have social media accounts. So um, the front and center for the, for the reasons behind the use of social media was to kind of create an alternative for a call center to have the questions that would not have personalized information attached to them answered through social media platform. Um, and at Ontario level, uh, they were saying that they were pretty successful to actually achieve this. I do not believe that uh, this was um, definitely achieved at the federal level because of the many reasons, but this um, goal as is, um, is definitely worth thinking about. Is social media actually something that does exist there just for the sake of rerouting the questions from the call center to a different platform? Uh, what is not mentioned here, but definitely stood out in the interviews as well, is the lack of analysis of social media data that was going on uh, both in IRCC and MCI at this time. So although um, both government agencies did have a uh, software hootsuite that would allow them to see what tweets were um, 
mentioning them and uh, address at them as well as what were the Facebook posts and MCI did allow private Facebook messaging. However, um, they were not analyzing this data in any shape and form other than just uh, being uh, in, in terms of um, the volume of requests that they were dealing with, reacting to this volume of requests. So moving on, um, there, there were some uh, important insights from the interviews, uh, as well as from the social media data analysis that I wanted to share. Um, one of them is that social media teams in government agencies that I uh, researched on uh, were very small. This is three to four people, and they are located very higher up in the hierarchy of the traditional bureaucracy. So it's a communication office, and the communication office within Canadian government is located with the uh, deputy Min minister's office. And for folks who are do not know deputy minister is the highest civil servant job in Canadian bureaucracy for a line ministry, which is um, responsible for immigration. So they are very detached from those people who are actually looking into immigration matters and are subject matter experts in the specific immigration program. But they are the ones who are maintaining social media channels. Um, the functionality that was enabled on IRCC, Twitter, and Facebook was pretty limited. And to be able to get a response from IRCC um, in, in, in a personal message, uh, you had to um, first um, ask them to follow you. And this was an additional step for folks to actually undergo until they were able to get the response back. Um, and last but not the least here, um, although I did show you that on Twitter, the majority of tweets back at users were to provide them with a response. When the actual counting was done, it was, uh, on, it showed that only 30% of questions on Twitter were answered. Uh, Facebook was much, much lower number at 3%. And this of course uh, kind of supports the statement that Facebook and Twitter are uh, used differently, but is the use of Twitter on itself enough if the main purpose of this is sort of to provide the response back in a customer service uh, function? Uh, I already talked about the um, lack of analysis of social media content, so I'm not going to go into details about this. But what I also wanted to mention, and I know that I'm almost at time, is that there was a lot of concerning content on official IRCC Facebook page to folks advertising how to get a fake passport, how to get a fraudulent job offer to come to Canada and so on and so forth. And this content was not removed by the government agency, which was definitely really concerning and highlighted in my recommendations to actually really needed to, that this is something that really needs to be addressed. Um, on this note, I'm, I believe that's it from me for today and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria. That was a very interesting present, uh, presentation on uh, government uh, involvement on Facebook and uh, Twitter. Um, so this so so this concludes the uh, speaker panel session, uh, and we're going to open um, open up questions to the floor. But before I do that, uh, there there were a couple of questions on the uh, on 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 the group chat. So I'm just gonna um, so Irvin and uh, Cohen's questions have been answered, I think, almost completely. Uh, there was a question for Priya. 
regarding. Uh, so I'm just going to read out the question. Do you have an answer to your own ethics question as to what is our positionality in such a field and also on the language aspect? It would be interesting to delve into this further as it is taken in some studies as an indication of linkages with your diaspora. For example, if you tweet in Greek and you are Greek, but what about if people engage with social media in both home and host land languages? So the first, the first point is, a, is, I suppose, a work in progress when we think about our positionality, because it's also that as we confront new questions, maybe we become aware of, of new considerations. I think one of the questions that I get, and I've, and I've put it there in, in the chat uh, for others maybe to think about is, in many cases, at least in the diaspora context, you find that a lot of claims and a lot of grievances are connected to narratives of human rights, um, This, at least in the work that I've done. And so it reminds me of a lot of the work that uh, Cohen has done in situating um, methodologically this work through uh, social justice, let's say, right? Or acknowledging power relations. So. Maybe that's a way that we can acknowledge positionality. I don't know if we can account for everything uh, because we acknowledge that we can't essentialize groups. And so we're trying not to essentialize, but we have to account for our own positionality. So maybe that's, that's a way forward. And then to the other point about language, I think that this is a really interesting question, particularly in spaces that create um, culture and artifacts and forms of communication. You know. 10 years ago, would we be talking about memes in the same way that we're thinking about them today? And yet these are forms of communication. So with language, yes, you have that, um, maybe an essentialized, you speak this, so you're this. And now what we see is that there's a much more of a mixture uh, uh, between languages. And also I think I, I brought up even, you look at phonetically what, what people are doing to even communicate on Twitter but not but using English script, right? So there are so many different layers of what how language. I mean, that might be a question of integration and, and and what's happening there, right? Because I didn't talk about it a lot, but one question that I had in my data was why isn't there as much French? There should be, if it's if the goal is to engage with Canadians. But that could be also about like you know what what affordances and what availability and what the concerns are of the community, but. From a research perspective, it's an it's an interesting question. Thank you. Uh, so there was another question for Mirjim Twite. Uh, for Irvin, I think this was missed. Uh, I find your work on the performative role of digital infrastructures in the construction of the ideal Filipino overseas workers very interesting. I was wondering to what extent the construction of this ideal is also constructed around legalized journeys, therefore shaping particular journeys and restricting others. And what does, for instance, the expectation of being submissive mean when a person overseas finds themselves exploited or faces other forms of violence? Yeah, so maybe, maybe you can answer yes. these questions first, yeah. I was actually just typing how to, <laughs> to answer okay. on that. But it's good because um, when you think about Philippine migration, it's um, really, it's an industry. In the Philippines, it's um, transnationally coordinated. You have different agencies that broker um, Filipino workers across the world, and these agencies and even embassies and um, government offices they coordinate with other businesses across the world, um, particularly asking for um, what types of workers do you need for those services or those um, industries. So there are agencies, there are trainings that kind of like provide those. Um, guidance for Filipino workers on what to actually do overseas. In theory, it's actually presenting what they can do. And if there's an emergency, if there's an issue, these are the things that they can do. But in practice, that's actually uh, not happening. Because at the moment, even though um, the Philippines, the Philippine government is sending all of these um, uh, Filipino workers overseas and promising them the good life through earning dollars or, you know, telling them that they'll be safe in overseas or because there's an embassy that they can run to, it's not happening uh, in terms of the support because of the fact that um, a lot of documents, like even um, studies have emerged in terms of like lacking of um, government support when there is a problem for um, Filipino workers um, confronting, for example, legal issues, abuse and stuff like that. Or for example, um, if you're a Filipino domestic uh, worker and then you, you, you're, for example, a perfect example of this one is like, um, the one in Singapore, um, wherein there's an issue on um, 
what's her name? I couldn't, I couldn't remember the name. But yeah, it's it's a floor contemplation. You know, it's a domestic worker killed by the employer, and then the government is actually pushed to address this issue. But then the Philippine government was quite quick, and it still happened with all of the abuse and legal issue. And then that actually prompted for having um, some laws to support uh, Filipino workers overseas um, confronting abuse and all of this exploitation. But the problem is the Philippine government is not that strong to address and to help all of these migrant workers. And even my own experience in working overseas, like not in, um, in Australia, in, in Brunei before moving in here, there's like actually a narrative that if you're having issues with your employer, you don't go to the embassy, you just go home because the embassy couldn't actually help you. That's really sad because you're supposed to be helped by, by the, the government or I mean the embassy, you know, as representing the Philippine government in your host country, but it's not happening in that space. So it's very problematic when I think about brokering of Filipino workers because these workers are seen as economic subjects. They're, we're like vegetables, we're commodified, we're sold, you know, in different countries, but there's no protection. And even the issue of repatriation for Filipino, an example would be the COVID-19 impact. So we have seamen, you have seafarers, we have domestic um, workers or even um, overseas workers being made redundant by their um, companies. But the Philippine government couldn't even address of repatriating them properly to the country and not even thinking about providing them jobs that can support them to sustain in that kind of like redundancy or issue of being um, excluded in those spaces. That's very problematic. Um, it's very weak. The government is very weak in terms of addressing those um, issues. And also, um, in relation to the last question, let me add that this is where the um, different um, migrant groups would be playing a huge role. Because, for example, anakbayan, migrante, they really help migrants when they're um, is an issue, for example, in the host country, but not really the government. It's quite weak in that space. Thank you, Owen. Um, so it does. It seems like everyone uh, has answered those questions on the group chat. So I'm going to open up the floor to anyone who has uh, who has uh, any questions. You can just say your question verbally. No. Okay. So I mean, I I have a question for for Cohen actually. Uh, so uh, Cohen, um, you had mentioned uh, in Paradox One that. Uh, in 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 the migration literature, there's this uh, there's this divide or there's this paradox, like you mentioned, in in terms of uh, uh, transnationalism and and integration. Um, I'm going to assume that that maybe you were talking about integration from like an assimilationist type perspective. Um, there is uh, there is there are also concepts of uh, uh, multiculturalism, which which I'm wondering if they still fall within those two, within one or the other, or maybe they do bridge. Like uh, I assume that they they would bridge sort of like uh, that that paradox would would wouldn't it because yeah, most uh, multiculturalism policies in countries they try to like integrate people but at the same time they want you to have your transnational ties to your home country as well. Uh, th thanks, Lai. I think yeah, that's an important comment. Um, I think here we can separate. Uh, and should indeed tease out how integration and transnationalism also means many different things across different domains in policy, academia, and in different situated contexts. Uh, but indeed, I think uh, indeed the way in which uh, integration is perceived and done at the local level uh, or national level in some uh, in some countries, of course, much different in terms of indeed that some countries push for assimilationist uh, kind of models versus others, which recognize diversity, for example. Uh, so I think indeed uh, there is definitely leeway to see a uh, leeway to see uh, how we can conceptually bridge uh, between the two. But I also wanted to point out that I need in a lot of scholarship. And so we ourselves as scholars are also implicated in this and for example, focusing on uh, processes of local integration in a city or in a nation and thereby, for example, ignoring the transnational dimension or vice versa. Uh, kind of replicates this difference. And I think this speaks to a follow-up comment that I also saw in the chat by Helena, uh, who asked whether uh, indeed in doing this kind of work, should we uh, uh, always do both or do look at integration and transnationalism? 
I think at least when we're pursuing, for example, studies on transnational forms of communication, we should at least account in our work that this is only one of the dimensions, one of the practices uh, that we're uh, kind of covering, that these are like, uh, that these practices are always part of a wider set of practices, which both include transnational as well as local uh, and other forms of communication. Thanks. Thank you. Um, is there any other questions from anyone? Okay, then. Um, I also had a few questions for Priya, but uh, maybe we can talk about that later um, since we are running out of time. Um, we can do one question. One more question? Okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, so in, in those three network um, maps that you had presented us, uh, and they were all from, um, from, from people uh, from uh, ethnic communities that, uh, that were stateless. Uh, so I was just like, the, one of the thoughts that kind of came to my mind was, is, is there any connection between people that are becoming stateless or community ethnic communities becoming stateless and then going online or, um, or in, in connection to, uh, to one of Irvin's papers, he had, a, he had a quote, we are not only here but we are here in spirit. And I thought that was an interesting quote, but in, in your specific case, it seems like these people are not, not here, but they go online to, to, uh, to essentially create a community that previously didn't have any space. Yeah, so I think the, the one thing that uh, came out is that there are just so many different um, webs of imagined communities, let's say, because I mean, even in the case it, let's use the Palestinian case. So, you know, the methodology that was used was the same for every single uh, uh, study. So it was, you know, Palestinian diaspora, Tamil diaspora, the grievances at the time was around 2010, 2012, so at that time. But what I found was really interesting was that there was a network of progressive Jewish organizations that were equally part of this based on uh, part of this community. And so my methodology was to treat it as an ecosystem because I wasn't reducing based on the actor. I was looking at the themes and trying to situate identity from issues and ideologies and trying to look at boundaries and kind of where that situates. Um, so I don't know if that, that fully answers what, what you were um, asking, but I did notice that there were, there were findings that I would not have thought of had I not started online looking down because then that changed my sampling method changed as well. I looked at the sample of the, of the three uh, different uh, community maps, contacted certain amount of people through a variety of different mediums and was able to come up with a much more diverse sample of respondents that spanned globally, which was another really interesting thing where you know, I was interviewing bloggers that were much more comfortable in text versus people on Skype versus people in a coffee shop. And I guess that could be another study of in questions of integration because I'm looking at the demographic and the younger they were, the more likely they wanted to be through things like this. Great, thank you. Um, so if there's no more questions, then uh, I can conclude this uh, to conclude this session. Um, I would like to thank everyone that participated and uh, ev everyone that also uh, provided questions for the speakers and the speakers themselves for their time and their and their effort in this uh, in the session. I'm very grateful for your knowledge and your experiences. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much. I hope everyone has a good uh, good day or, or good night for some of y'all. <laughs>